What is up, beautiful people? Um, it is Allie, and I did my first live stream the other day. It was amazing, it was super fun, and it was fraught with lots of technical difficulties, which I have since sorted, thankfully, for the next one. However, I did wanna take that live and basically just remix it and capture like the pieces that weren't a mess. And um, there'll be some audio quality issues in here, but I think you get the gist of the content. It was just a fun conversation. And I'll just basically be putting that to a slideshow. Oh, wow, Self, that's cool. I'll basically be putting that to a slideshow of different visuals, but we'll cut into a section, which is just a bunch of photo stills from a lot of the cameras I have not yet reviewed on this channel, which are sitting in the closet so that you guys can decide which camera we're gonna shoot next after the SL42. Come here. So the link will be down below for that poll. And I hope, uh, don't kill me. I hope you enjoy the remix of the first live stream on OMTC. Can you hear me now? Is that working? Well, as I was thinking about this yesterday, I thought it would be really fun to talk about inspiration in general because I just got back from a whirlwind weekend in New York, as I'm sure you saw on Instagram, and it was such an inspiring 48 hours both from like, I'm, I'm from New York. Um, and so just being there, I haven't really been back since I moved to LA five years ago. So it was just super inspiring being back. And then like, besides the energy of the city itself, I saw a bunch of creative friends, really old friends, family. And I went to the Whitney and saw the um, Hopper exhibit there as well. So it was just like a sponge of creativity. And so I thought that would be kind of a fun like topic to bring here and just chat with you guys about what's inspiring you guys and kind of what, you know, what's been catching your attention. So with that, I also wanted to share, um, I don't know, anybody here familiar with Rick Rubin? I, I hope so, because like he's the most prolific record producer of all time. He just came out with a book, and that book is called uh, The Creative Act, A Way of Being. And this came up. He is the man, right? Like, he's phenomenal. This guy has literally made so much incredible art from music, but beyond music as well. And he also just lives this incredible philosophy that I am a huge, huge fan of. Um, so I was going to share a little bit of something that he said in a podcast recording that he did with another amazing person, Malcolm Gladwell, um, about kind of the influence of inspiration through other artists, because I feel like for me, that's what this is. You had that lovely thing about the back and forth between the, the Beatles and the Beach Boys. Brian Wilson sees White Album and says, was it White Album that inspires? No, it, was, him? it starts with it starts with um, Rubber Soul. It starts with Rubber Soul. Yeah, and then based on Brian Wilson hearing Rubber Soul, he makes Pet Sounds. Based on the song God Only Knows, Paul has the idea for Sergeant Pepper. Yeah, and and the point that I make there is not they weren't doing that at a competition. It was out of love and inspiration. Mm -hmm. And it was an upward spiral between them of inspire a reaction, inspire a reaction, inspire, lifting the level, lifting the level. It, what, it was, they made each other better. Mm -hmm. They weren't trying to beat each other. It was different than that. They loved each other. Yeah. They leveled each other up. And I, and I really loved that as a philosophy because I think that that's totally what I'm seeing on YouTube and in this community in particular. I feel like this is a really good... Um, you know, I think competition can be a real thing, but like, I feel like this community is all built on trying to build each other up. And I'm really inspired by that. That gets me really excited. I will link this whole interview. It's the Pushkin, um, like Malcolm Gladwell's podcast company is called Pushkin. And he did this interview there. It is absolutely phenomenal like such an inspiration um steve i see i see you saying that your source of inspiration is the growing number of photography channels and see what everyone's doing i totally agree i love rick rubin's philosophy because his other thing was he writes in the book that if there are five mistakes the work of art is probably um not ready and if there are eight mistakes, then you're good to release it. When the work has five mistakes, it's not yet completed. 
When it has eight mistakes, it might be. Yes. Rick, what does that mean? We get hung up on the idea of perfection. Mm -hmm. And we think perfection is what we're looking for. When really what we're looking for is something with emotion in it, something with humanity in it. And humanity has flaws. Mm -hmm. So we can use the example of the, of, uh, the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. At the time that it was made, it was a mistake. And now it's one of the most visited buildings in the world. And it's visited purely because of the mistake. You know, we collect old Persian rugs that were handmade and that had been lived in, whereas you can buy a new machine-made rug now that's more perfect than that, but it doesn't have the same humanity in it. Mm -hmm. And the reason I use the example of five and eight are uh, they're ra they're random choices. Those are not specific. Yeah. <laughs> those yeah, are yeah. not the. <laughs> yeah. Those are not. If you have five, you got to get to eight for it to work. <laughs> but it's a way of thinking where we're not looking to make it perfect. We're looking for the soulful version. Mm -hmm. That's very much this community, and I think also leans very much into the digicam thing that we're going through right now. Um, just about like embracing imperfection. And so this live stream is a beautiful categorization of imperfection. Um, and we're just rolling with it. So thank you guys for being patient. I see some questions coming in here. Um, do you ever shoot TLR film cameras? I do, Andrew. So I actually had the most beautiful. <laughs> this is like one of those, why did I let it go kind of things. I had an absolutely gorgeous Roloflex 2.8 F. Um, that is actually one of the longest running film cameras I ever owned because when I met my husband at one point, I almost sold it and he was like, you can't, you can't sell it. Even if you never use it, it's just like such a beautiful art piece. So we kept it forever. And then eventually when we moved to California, I did finally sell it, but I'm still mad at myself for doing that. That's what happens. So, you know, you fall in love with cameras, you use them and I just wasn't using it enough. I even got the, um, prism for it. Cause I am not good with ground glass looking down. I love the look and feeling of it. It's very romantic. And like, I would love to think that I'm, you know, Vivian Mayer, but I'm not. So I just never got used to the ground glass. And I put the prism on it, which weighed a literal ton. Um, and I just found I wasn't using it nearly enough to justify having it. But it is... Oh, such a beauty. And now I do actually have another TLR. It's a it's a different one, not not as fancy at all. Oh, Eduardo, thank you. Honestly, your channel opened up not just a universe of cameras to explore, but also a community of things to share. I could not agree more. Like this, um, this community really does feel like a community. Like in New York, I got to meet one of the people that I have been following on Instagram for a long time. I can't remember if he followed me first or I followed him first, but he's a big Olympus user. His name is Jude. And it was just amazing to like be in person and get to actually talk about like he had his Olympus C5040, which hot tip, he said is better than the C5050, which I had. So I'm really curious to try that now. Um, but just like being there was so much fun and actually having this community to connect with is 100% like key, key inspiration. And on that note, Sophie Lee, who I did the camera chat with, who is part of Digicam Love, uh, her, one of the other Digicam Love counterparts who lives in New York is actually here in LA and they're going to be doing a photo walk in LA on Sunday this week. So if anyone is in LA and interested, I am going to socialize that information. Those moments of like physical and human interaction are 100% like the most fun. What's your opinion of the Olympus E or Pen EP3? So I only shot the EP1, which I did a review of um, way, way early in the channel. I can only imagine that the EP3 is a slight improvement over that. And I know those do not have CCD sensors. They have the, C or the um, live MOS sensors, if I recall correctly. But they're great. Like, I think those early Olympus cameras, I mean, even, even modern Olympus cameras are great. OM system, sorry. Um, but those early Olympus cameras are really wonderful. I, I kind of want to try one of the minis because they are definitely the, the EP just standard. It's a little bit chunky, um, which is kind of fun. Like I like it, but I'm curious to get like a little bit of the slimmer form factor, just both visually and from a, an ergonomic standpoint to see what that would be like. And I haven't tried like the pen, which is definitely on the bucket list. Um, but yeah, the, those early EPs are, are pretty cool cameras, I think. 
Um, what else? What What have you guys been watching or listening to? Or like, have there been any like exhibits you've seen? Like I did go to the Edward Hopper exhibit at the Whitney in New York while I was there. And that was just amazing. It was all about his connection specifically to New York and kind of his activism in the neighborhood. So he, he lived, you know, and a lot of his scenes are around Washington Square Park. And then he was in Brooklyn. And it was just just you get to see his sketches and like his whole process for how he would develop these sort of scenes. And, you know, it was a very, very inspiring exhibit. The Van Gogh Museum was inspiring. Okay, which Van Gogh Museum did you go to? Because I think there's one in Amsterdam and then there's the one in France. Um, Yay. Okay, great. I'm glad the video is working again. But Aurora, I'm curious to hear which which one you went to because Van goes, oh, okay, in Amsterdam. Amazing. I did not get to go there. I stopped over in Amsterdam very briefly when I met uh, Sophie and I didn't get to make it to any museums, but I definitely want to go back. Scott, nice to see you here. This is so fun. This is what I love about live streaming. Now, I do wish there was more like I, like a call-in version of this. And now I'm afraid that my computer will totally crash if I try to input the discord but i did put a voice channel in the discord so that people could call in if you will and it could be a bit more like real time back and forth but this is great and yeah seeing everybody at the beers and cameras scott meeting you yeah this discord really is popping this is really nice to see all of you here okay so this is great you are inspired by painters and i think that that's a really appropriate source of inspiration like i definitely find a lot of inspiration. I think in painters, in architects. I'm not an architectural photographer by any means, but I do love seeing architectural photography. Um, We have some UK, Utah, Montana. Dang, you guys, this is great. I love it. Brazil. Eduardo, I think we chatted on Instagram, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it was in the YouTube, in the, yeah, YouTube comments. Very cool. This is great representation. Wow. Turkey, Antwerp, Brazil. This is very, very exciting. Okay. So here's another random source of inspiration. When I was flying back from New York to LA, I was on like a very budget airline um, and their Wi-Fi was just completely out the whole way back. And I only had one thing downloaded on my phone. And I was like, I have six hours here. I didn't want to be on my computer. Like I, I didn't download any movies or anything like that. So I was really excited to just like listen to an audiobook. But unfortunately, the only audiobook that I had downloaded way prior was a very specific, very niche thing. I'm really into history. I specifically love Roman history. And I had downloaded an audiobook about the history of Rome through Hollywood cinema and its accuracy or the accurate depictions. And so it went through like movie by movie of like all sword and sandal flicks from like the 40s to today and just kind of cataloged what was accurate, what was inaccurate in Hollywood's portrayal. Weirdly inspiring, you guys, like very, very like sounds very academic, but it was actually really, really fascinating. And, you know, I love, there's a a phenomenal editor named Walter Murch. He edited all of the Godfather flicks. He did Apocalypse Now, which might be one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, He did The English Patient. Like he's just, he's, he's edited a ton of amazing movies. And one thing that I thought he said, which was really interesting, he wrote a book called The Conversations, where he talks, it was literally a conversation with this journalist, and they wrote a whole book out of their back and forth uh, interviews. And it's a great book, highly recommended if anybody has really any interest in the creative process, period. It's not about editing. But there's definitely a lot of, you know, sort of editorial commentary in there. However, what he said was he doesn't look at other movies for inspiration, which I thought was really interesting. His thing was he would really look to music. So he would go to a lot of classical music um, concerts or, you know, deep dive into old catalogs of, you know, forgotten musicians, etc. And he said he got all of his editing pacing from music and that he actively tried not to see other films so as not to be like influenced in 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 a way that would cause him to be 
um, to know the box that he was working in. He wanted to think outside the box. So I thought that was a really interesting perspective. I love working at uh, looking at other photographers work, but I also really do love, you know, all these weird sort of seemingly discordant um, influences. So the Roman history one is kind of my my way into that. Did you speak with Jason? What does he think about DigiCams? You know, I actually did not really. So um, the beers and cameras, w which was honestly so much fun. Uh, I came on the early-ish side because I was meeting some friends there who could only come at the very beginning of the event. And then they left. And then I had more friends come. And so I came on the early side and... They hadn't. They they eventually opened up like a third floor of this bar, but this all took place in a bar in New York. And the moment I walked in, first off, I was wearing like a cashmere sweater and my giant fluffy now very famous jacket. Um, and the reason was I I was coming from New York. I had no idea what the weather would be like, but I walked into this bar and I was like, oh my god, I'm hot. And then everyone was gathering on the second floor and it was like a hot box up there. I'm not kidding you. I was just like sweating. So I went back downstairs and just, you know, eagle eyed a table and just took over a table. And I'm like, this is where I'm camping out. I kind of just stayed put like I didn't. I and, and Jason's very good at like going around. So he was kind of, you know, going around upstairs. Bless him. I, I don't know how anybody survived up there. Scott, you were up there. So you can tell us how you survived. But it was so hot. And then eventually they opened up the third floor. But so we didn't get to talk to Cams. I am curious to hear what he thinks of them. Um, but Caleb, who like has a whole separate channel, or like Instagram account, Bad Flashes, even though his YouTube is Bad Flashes, but his Instagram Bad Flashes is specifically for Digicams. If you didn't know that you should go follow it because it is really fun to see his Digicam shots as well. Tricky, a musician did that where he didn't listen to music to not be influenced. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really, it's an interesting idea. I feel like, oh God, yeah, Deer Hunter. Sorry. Someone just said Deer Hunter is a banger of a movie. Aurora couldn't agree more. Um, I think that the, the idea of trying to not be influenced is also it's, it's, you, you have to know yourself, right? Like, where does that line get drawn? For me personally, I love, I love being influenced. I don't have a problem seeing other people's work. So anybody seen anything lately or seen any channels or photographers that they're interested? I will say I just saw, this will be an issue that some of you may have noticed, but there aren't as many females in this space, which really does drive me super crazy. I'm so glad to have like linked up with Lucy Lumen because we, I mean, you guys don't, don't hear it, but like we chat all the time, like offline. Um, and it's, it's just really refreshing. And so I did see Polly B just did a walkie talkie with a female street photographer. I don't see a lot of that. And so I like, especially want to hear if anybody knows of any great female photographers or creators, because I think that that is one of the things that I really want to try to push for to see that there's more visibility around um, some of the some of the amazing women out there doing great stuff like Lucy. Um, Sean P. Bruce was at the Beers and Cameras meetup. Chill channel. You know, I don't even think I know his channel. That's cool. I have to look that up. He seems super genuine, but I dig his work too. Yeah, it's really cool to see, you know, some of the channels. There were some other folks there at the Beers and Cameras that I wasn't familiar with prior either. And that's always really exciting. And actually one of them um, uh, was like just getting into Digicams. So that was really cool. He was like, oh, tell me more about Digicams. And he just got a G2, a Canon G2. So that was, you know, it's always like, it's like seeing a relative at like a renew or at a, at a party that you didn't expect and being like, oh, that's a Canon G2. It was very exciting. Sophia Carey. She is great. I really like her channel. I love T Hopper's channel. If anyone's not following T Hopper, you are missing out hard. Um, she is just, I love her perspective, but I also just love all the, you know, all the people that she features. It's really inspirational. Talk about inspirational. Um, very small indie YouTubers give me a lot of inspiration. Get a creative kick every time I find a new one. Yeah. World of Jesse. You know, that's so funny. I totally ran into that channel. I can't remember. Um, 
what I saw, but it was, I, I definitely, that, that rings a bell. GX Ace is God tier. No joke. Um, he's amazing. I did meet him and he was so lovely. He was so, so nice. I was like that person who was like, hi, I, you don't know me, but you know, Lucy and I'm a friend with her. Cotton is a female fashion photographer who I think lives in New York, but she's originally from the UK. I've followed her for years since her early days on Divian art, Divian art. Holy that is an old school reference. I love it. Lindsay Adler's portraiture. Yep, totally. Gosh, she's been around for quite a moment, hasn't she? Speaking of Lindsay Adler, Lindsay Adario. I mean, again, not an unknown name, but if anyone's not familiar, she has a book. So freaking inspiring. It's crazy. Gosh, now I can't remember the name of it, but it's her biography. And if you don't have time to read like me, I highly recommend an audio book. I did actually read her book, though, and I read it cover to cover, and I swear, like, three days. It was unbelievable. Her story is incredible. Her passion and her dedication to photography is next level. But beyond photography, really, what it does is a form of activism. Um, it's really incredible. The Kodak DC4800 has been a game changer for me. Aurora, that camera is so cool. I brought that to Prague, actually, and there were a couple of shots in that Prague blog that I did with that camera. And I really, I really like it as well. It's such a, it's also just such a funny form. Like it's got that funny grip. Um, but I, I really like that camera as well. James Syops is so funny. Like there's a lot of, a lot of crossover here. I'm obviously a bit of a YouTube consumer. I love watching YouTube. So I do, I watch all these people and I really like James as well. Cause I used to be all micro four thirds and so did he. I know he's now shooting Sony, but he's like also saying very clearly that he's not inspired by the Sony cameras. So now he's picking up all these different ones. He just came out, I think with the GR three X video today or yesterday. Um, Margaret Soraya has a lovely YouTube channel and podcast. She's a British landscape photographer. Very cool. I'll have to check, check her out. I don't know her. I primarily, I'm primarily digital, got a film camera recently and will slowly dip my toes into it, but not before I get the Olympus E1 and some fourth earth lenses. Oh, I mean, that is basically digital film that, that camera. It's so funny because in my feed yesterday, a bunch of photos came up and I just immediately was like, oh, that's the E1. That's like, it's just such a beautiful camera. I really think the output is very distinct from that one. I came from film long Long time Olympus XA shooter, awesome camera. Um, and my love of your love of Olympus Digicams got me into shooting digital now. My film is still shot occasionally, occasionally, but digital is now my everyday carry camera. I mean, I think that that's what's so great, right? Like, that's how I treat it as well. I, I really do treat film like a special occasion thing, and I love it, but I just, it seems so. I don't know. For me, it seems excessive to be shooting that as like a point and shoot, even though I love the aesthetic of a point and shoot, but like, it feels so like every time I take a picture, I'm like, Oh, that's a dollar. <laughs> like basically between like purchasing the film, developing it and scanning it. Um, this is funny. So everyone is talking about this LX 100 after my X 10 video. I got a lot of comments in the X 10 video because I know I said at the end of the X 10 video, how I couldn't really think of too much that is in that price category or, you know, capabilities kind of bucket. And the LX100 came up a lot. So I have shot the LX100. And funny enough, um, after all those comments, y'all convinced me to get one again. So I have one on order. It's coming. I will review it. The LX100 is a 24 to 70 millimeter lens. It has a micro four thirds sensor. I got the Mark one. There are two versions. Um, that camera is fantastic and I remember loving it, but it's been a minute since I shot it. So I do have it on order again. I will get, you know, brush it off and get my thoughts together on that one. But from what I recall, I really liked it. It's interesting that that was kind of the one that was cited the most as a compliment or competitor to the X10. I can see the connection. I can see why that would be. I'm really curious to see, I have my initial thoughts on like, I, I kind of feel like they're not exactly kind of the same. The LX100, that 24 to 70, it's wider on the wide end because the X10 is 28 and it's shorter on the long end. It goes to 70 on the X LX100 and it goes to 112 on the X10. That being said, those are like minuscule 
things. And obviously the LX100 has the bigger sensor because it's a two thirds inch sensor on the X10 and it's a micro four thirds on the LX100. So I'm really curious to pull that back out and give that a run. Um, I do have really fond memories. I have a very funny, I love micro four thirds. I still have, I would say mostly micro four thirds. Like the videos that I shoot, this is, I'm shooting on the ZV-1 right now from Sony just cause that's like a good streaming camera, even the, even if we're having all these streaming issues. Um, but typically like all of my videos on the channel are shot with an Olympus EM5 Mark III. So it's a micro four thirds and I love it because it's so small and the lenses are really good, blah, blah, blah. So I can, I can travel with that. No problem. So I'm a big fan of micro four thirds, but for some reason I remember there being some little things on the LX100 that kind of made me like just from a file quality standpoint, made me a little bit um, not super fond of it. I can't remember exactly if it was like the files were a little crunchy or I do also remember that there was definitely lens distortion on that camera, but I'll save it for the review. We'll definitely do a review of that one. I just sold my Fuji X100V to buy back the old X-T30 or X30 and X100T. Yeah. Yeah. It's a funny one. Like that X100V is such a good camera. Like I'm not taking anything away from it. And like for those who have it and love it, I'm, I, I, I can't endorse it more for that. But for me personally, it, it just, it felt almost too good. You know, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm definitely a bit of a masochist. I like it to be a little bit more challenging. Oh, Jude, you're practicing for your audition. Oh, well, thanks for being here. Don't stay here too long. I want you to like nail that audition and go wherever you want to go. Um, and that's, that's Jude who I mentioned. I, I met at the beers and cameras. So it's really exciting. Um, I'm almost exclusively film myself, so this is eager. But lately, I've been transitioning to more digital with an, a Fuji XE4. I've been tempted into experimenting with Digicams after finding the channel, though. Yeah, the Fuji XE4 is a phenomenal camera. I had the XE3, which I really liked. You know what I didn't like, though? It's funny because it's just so personal. I actually sold that camera because it was it was like the big hype around it was all the gestures that you could do, but I, I, I really didn't like that as much as I like buttons. So I kind of, I don't know, but as far as the output, I mean, it was a fantastic camera. Um, but the Digicams, yeah, get one. They're fun. The great things about Digicams is too, is like you, they're, they can be very throwaway if you want, or you can really like lean in hard and, and, you know, try to dial it down and make it amazing. Um, black and white tangible moments. I shoot film or I still shoot film, but recently picked up my first digital camera, the PowerShot G2. That's a great camera. I really kudos to Sophie Lee, um, who I interviewed on the channel from Digicam Love. She's the one who turned me onto that camera. She turned, I think everyone onto that camera. Um, and then I told Lucy about it and I got one for Lucy for her birthday. And now I feel like it's just like, it really has one of the closest sort of out of camera outputs to portrait film of the digicams that I've tried. And I really do like it. I think it's really good. Um, yeah, film is definitely getting expensive. I hear that. Let's see, Scott, 80% film, 20% digital, but loving the M9 colors. Oh man. I, oh man, I have not done, it's funny. I did the M8 review. I don't have an M9. I have an ME, but it is basically exactly the same as an M9 minus two features. So more or less the same. I do want to review that camera. It's funny because I, I try to really balance the channel between like, like fancy cameras like Leica's because I love them, but I also just really want to like lean into accessible cameras that it's funny though. Cause of course it's the minute you do, it's just the, the YouTubers dilemma, but the minute you do a review it becomes an inaccessible camera, like King Japes did that video on the SD 100 or SD 1000 from Canon. And it literally went from a $10 camera to like $120 camera. And it's not worth a hundred, $120. Very cute, but don't, don't buy it for that price. Cool. Yeah. XE2. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I do like some of those older Fuji. I mean, I have to say the X10 surprised me. I did not remember liking that camera. I actually almost sold it and then just decided right before selling it that I would do that review. And, and I'm glad that I did. Um, yeah, that I love adapting the old lenses to, to digital too. I think that's great. I mean, that's, you know, the, the beauty of mirrorless. 
Sammy's in Pasadena had a super clean M9, but I was like, nope, OMTC hasn't reviewed it yet. <laughs> That's amazing. The M9 is a great camera. It is very different from the M8, though. It's really interesting. The output is very different. Um, I took both with me on a vacation a year ago, at least, maybe two years ago, and shot them side by side. And I was really surprised how how different the sort of color output was. The Kodak CCD in the, in the M8 just has a I don't know. It's like more, I would say M9 is more slide-like and Kodak is more Kodak-like. I, I mean, that's not, Kodak obviously makes slide film too, but there, there definitely is a difference, but I will say I love them both very much. And the M9 with that full frame is stunning, like just absolutely stunning. I, I do really love that camera. Um, the EP7. Yeah, I've seen that. I have not I've not tried it, but um, you can adjust the tone curve and individual colors just like the Pen F. I think that would be really fun. I, I'm so okay. Jumping to like current cameras, this is crazy because I don't follow new cameras, but I did notice the Panasonic S5 Mark II that's coming out or just came out. And that camera looks insane, like really cool, um, especially if you're a hybrid shooter and you want to do video, that camera looks amazing. But one of the things that they're doing is real-time LUT, which I think is really cool. Um, it basically applies your color profile, which you can create on your own, on your software, and then import to the camera. And it will, like for video, apply that in real time, kind of the way that you would for a cinema camera. And I just think that's really cool that they're starting to integrate that into more consumer or prosumer cameras as well. Um, help me choose one. The pan the power shot, the oh God, I can't talk. Canon power shot. Oh, did I stop? Is this still working? Oh no. The Canon power shot G12 or Lumix LX5. Okay. This is my hot take. I actually get, it's funny, this, this kind of comparison between the, the power shots and the Lumix. It depends on how much post-processing you're willing to do. For me, the both the body and the buttons, and I have smaller hands, like that's the other thing, take into consideration your your body. But like for me, the ergonomics on that camera, I just love the LX5 I'm talking about. I love the ergonomics of that. I love that I have a button for everything. It's small, it's a compact camera. And that's the other thing that I love is that I can just pack it up, put it in my bag and go and it takes no space, but I still have all that manual control. And I love that one. Um, as far as the G series lineup, they get bigger, they're chunkier. They're not big, but they're definitely chunkier. So they're nicer probably for larger hands. I would say the Canon straight out of like straight out of camera JPEGs are probably going to be more visually appealing. Like the Panasonic Lumix JPEGs of that era were not good, in my opinion. I don't like them. Um, so I shoot that camera on RAW. But if you like black and white, the dynamic black and white out of the, the LX5 is just bananas. It's so pretty. Um, it gives like a really contrasty, but like a real tri quality to it. It has a beautiful grain. It's a really, really, really nice JPEG file. So I like to shoot that one JPEG and raw. So I have that black and white, just very similar to the X10 when it is shot so that I have the JPEG in black and white in that dynamic black and white setting. And then I have the raws as, you know, something I can alter for color, but I don't like the color JPEGs right out, right out of camera from the Lumix. The Canon is better. I, I still would shoot that one in raw if if it were me, um, but that's because I'm also like a little compulsive about my colors. Oh, Kodak made the M9 too? I didn't realize that. I, have to, I clearly have to do that review. I have not tried the Leica X. Um, I have heard about that one. Yeah, buying one because they are relatively cheap for Leicas. I mean, it, it's worth checking out. Um, oh, that's so cool, Scott. So he had a, he had a, an M10P and he sold it and kept the M9. Yeah, the M9 is just really, it's its a its a banger. If you review the Panasonic LX100, it would be interesting to A-B it with the Leica Deluxe. I'm not gonna lie, I am not a great a beer. Like I am not technical, as you can see. I'm like, I like sort of some of the technical aspects of photography, but I am not someone who like sits and does charts in a studio or anything like that. But I can definitely give sort of like my 
sense of what the AB would be like, but I feel, I always feel really bad like ABing cause I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to sit there and like, you know, measure color accuracy or anything like that. I'm, I'm pretty terrible at that, uh, but at least I know myself. Um, I love my EM2 and EM1X. Ooh, that EM1X, I'm, I'm eager to try it. It's so big, but I kind of, I'm liking big cameras right now. They're kind of fun. I have not seen Rick Powell's documentary, The Individualist. Um, no, that's not off topic at all, because that sounds like an inspiration source. And that's, that's what today is all about. So I'll definitely want to check that out. Um, I'm, I'm going to thank you. Yeah, if anybody has, I'm obsessed with documentaries. So if anybody has great documentaries, send them my way. I love, love to look at those. I'm really into dual systems camera camcorder. Did you pick up a TX1? I do not have a TX1. Okay, I do. So that's in reference to um, Henny the Business is a, a channel here on YouTube. And he's so lovely. Oh my God, talk about a guy who's just like, you know, a level upper of other people on YouTube. He got into DigiCams. He reached out to me and just wrote a super nice note with, you know, just saying how much he liked the channel. And then he made a video about his love of Digicamps and he talked about the Canon TX1, which I do not have. Um, they're really hard to find, but I did get a different one recently, which you'll see probably on the channel shortly because I've been shooting it a lot lately, but it's very similar. I wish it's, it's back there, but it's very similar. It's like that pistol grip style, old school camcorder with the flip out screen. And it is so cool. I love it so much. I'm trying to remember what it's called. It's like the TS 100 or something like that. But, um, yeah, it's a really great camera. And I think it has a very similar output to the TX one. It's of the same sort of generation. Casey Neistat made that TX one what it is. And, you know, back in the day, um, he was shooting that all the time and his, his whole philosophy was very much aligned. Like it's almost like we're just secular in our, in our patterns. Right. And we're back to that early sort of use what you have kind of filmmaking state. And I love it. Um, so I'm loving the one that I picked up and I just can't remember the name off the top of my head. Can we get an LA beers and cameras meetup going 100%. So I don't know, um, if you're aware, but Adam, so while New York beers and cameras was happening, there was the LA beers and cameras happening at the same time alongside the SD chapter, which is like the OG San Diego, um, and that crew all went to Las Vegas at the same time that the New York one was happening. And ironically, I was actually going to Las Vegas. I had a flight booked. I had a hotel. I was going to meet up with the crew from LA in Las Vegas and do that whole weekend. And I was so excited about it. It was super exciting. And Caleb, like... DM'd me that he was going to be in New York. And I was like, damn it. So I like changed all my plans because I have family in New York. So it's like, okay, this actually makes sense because I haven't been back to New York since I moved here five years ago. So it's a perfect opportunity for me to squeeze everything into 48 hours. And it worked out so beautifully. Um, but I was supposed to go to that Beers and Cameras in Las Vegas. So we do have, you know, fairly frequent meetups here in LA for the Beers and Cameras LA. And I go to almost all of them. Like that crew is amazing. Like we're kind of a, a small but like mighty crew that always meets up and it's really, really fun. So if you don't know about that, go to the Beers and Cameras website and look up the LA chapter and you'll see where the meetups are posted. But better yet, go follow them on Instagram because that's where like Adam actually posts like information about where we'll be. And it's usually two or three days beforehand. So it can kind of be at the last minute, but it's really, really fun. My current and prettiest camera is the Olympus EP one. It's a great one. So yeah, I think I just did the EPL one, um, which was literally like maybe my second video or something like that. It's really, really, it's really funny to, I mean, not that my videos are like great production quality now, but looking back then it was even more, uh, hysterical Gordon Park stock on HBO max. Oh man. I haven't seen that one yet. I really want to see that. That is, he's Oh, what a legend. His work is so beautiful. Sanyo Exacti VPC HD 2000. Wow. Don't even know that one. Is that one of those cell phones? Is that a cell phone? Sorry, I should probably know more about Sanyo. Um, the EP2 and 20 millimeter. So that 20 millimeter from Lumix on the Micro Four Thirds system is, it's slow as a lens, but man, that thing is just a gem. Like if anyone has micro four thirds and doesn't have that lens, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It's pretty much the only thing I put on my body when I'm just like out and about. If you haven't seen helmet by June, you have to, okay. 
I have not seen that. And it's funny that you say that because like literally right now, holding up my computer, hold on, I'm going to put this down. So I have a giant helmet book holding up my computer right now. Oh, no, sorry. This is an Herbert's book. My bad. Um, I thought it was a helmet book. We have a lot of helmet books, too. Um, I would love to see that because I know how much uh, my, my father was super influenced and um, admiring of Helmet Newton. And I know how much a role his wife, June, played in, in, in his career and just the work that they created together. And so I definitely want to watch that. Thank you for mentioning that. I kind of forgot that that was there. I have the Canon GX G1X Mark II. That's funny. I almost ordered that camera last night. <laughs> Can you tell that I have a problem? How do you like that camera? I'm really curious to hear um, more about it. Doesn't sound like you use it very much, so I, maybe I made the right choice going with the LX100. Um, okay, yeah, it's getting late. Well, goodbye, Steve. It's late over there for sure. Maybe a bit early for Lucy and Oz. Yeah, I, it's way too early for them. It's always hard finding a good time for everybody, and I, I actually have to go to because I... Um, kind of have to do a little work as well but I was like oh I have my lunch hour off today this doesn't usually happen by the way like usually I mean I feel like that's just the modern era everybody works through lunch which is not right um and hopefully will change but I was like oh today is a perfect day for a for a little stream well you guys thank you this was so fun I appreciate everyone coming and showing up and also just like hanging out love all the back and forth in the uh, the chat next time I will get this discord thing dialed and what's so fun about that is you can literally call in like you can hit the voice channel and then you can actually like live chat which I love the concept of because it feels a little awkward talking to myself even though I'm talking to you guys and you guys are wonderfully talking back in the chats it's always really nice to actually hear a voice so thank you guys for showing up this was amazing and yeah, we're going to do it again, I promise. And it will it will go a little more smoothly. And now I have to figure out how to turn this off. There's a line in the book, and I only know it because I was working on the audio book yesterday, and, and I read it yesterday. And it's, again, it's a funny, counterintuitive line that self-expression is not about you. Ah, and I, I underline just, that. Yeah, it's <laughs> just such a... And when I read it, you know, it's it stopped me in my tracks, even though... It's an idea from several years ago, but it hit me hard again, it, you know, recognizing it. So everything we are comes from outside of us. The data that we take in from which we make whatever it is that we make comes from outside of us. All of it. None of it starts with us. Mm -hmm. Everything starts outside of us. So we have a storehouse of all of the stuff that we've experienced over the course of our lives. And then we can find connections between those things. And we can find connections between those things from the past and these things happening now, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking for it, it's surprising how often the answers are right there.